After a couple years in early access, Gordian Quest had its 1.0 full release a couple weeks ago. I've been playing it since then, and it's been incredibly fun. I love playing around with the unique and complex systems in this game, though there are a couple notable flaws. So let's get into it. Gordian Quest is a unique hybrid deck builder tactical RPG roguelite. The game has two main game modes, a 10 to 15 hour campaign mode and a more standard roguelite mode. I'm going to talk about the core gameplay first, and then I'll talk about each of the two game modes separately later on. In both game modes, you play as a team of three characters, each of whom have their own deck, equipment, and skill trees. The attack order for each character, both allies and enemies, are determined by their initiative level. But most of the time, all of your units and heroes go first, and then all the enemy units go second. You play cards for each of your characters on their turns to attack enemies, apply buffs or debuffs, or just move around the field. You can also see what cards enemy units will play on their turns, so you can plan accordingly. Like a standard deck builder, most cards cost AP, equivalent to energy or action points. While you can increase your pool later on, each character starts out with three AP they can use to play cards. However, there's also a second currency that's called SP. While AP automatically regenerates at the start of each turn, SP is carried over across turns and even across fights. You mostly gain SP by just playing cards, but there are a couple other ways to gain SP as well. Gaining this SP currency allows you to play a different set of cards that are SP cards as opposed to your normal basic AP cards. Managing SP in addition to AP adds more synergy and resource management to the game, and I found it to be a nice twist to the standard three energy point system that permeates a lot of card game roguelites. Positioning is incredibly important in this game, and moving a character one tile or grid over can make the difference between a character dying or taking zero damage. Additionally, many cards have limitations based on where your character is positioned. For example, some cards will buff only adjacent allies, and most attack cards can only hit enemies within a certain range of that hero. Because of that, you'll often move characters around in order to hit enemies or avoid damage. All decks have one built-in movement card that costs SP, and this card will always pop up in your hand when you have enough SP to use it. Of course, there are other cards that allow for movement, but this basic built-in SP card makes sure that every starter deck has one movement card built in, and that's again because moving your heroes around is just so important in this game. I really like this core gameplay system. It feels familiar to traditional card game roguelites, but it has a nice addition of SP, the second energy resource, and the importance of positioning adds a great new element to play around with. The game also has a number of different condition effects and buffs and ground obstacles, and all these adds a nice gameplay variety. And again, it just underscores the importance of positioning your heroes and enemies. I would say that it feels like a deck builder card game first and foremost, and those tactical elements and RPG elements that I'll talk about in a second are important, but they're slightly less central than that deck building. I also think this game has good enemy variety. While there are times where you will just face roll several fights in a row, they'll be incredibly easy. At hard difficulties, the variety of enemy types will force you to take on different play styles, such as changing which enemies you target first, making you debate between tanking enemy hits versus avoiding them, and just those small strategy points like that, which change depending on which enemy you're fighting, make that enemy variety enjoyable. Before I fully dive into the build crafting and RPG elements, I want to say that I think this game has a little bit of system overload. There are a lot of moving parts and a lot of ways to modify each character and their cards or decks, but I think it's important to know right now, you absolutely do not have to engage with every single system, every single mechanic in order to have fun with the game and make fun builds. So to start off, this game is built around three main stats that modify your cards. You have strength, dexterity, and intelligence. And the cards are color coded to match each stat that modifies them. So red cards are strength cards, for example. But there are also cards that are statless, which means that they aren't modified by any of those three stats. When leveling up each character, primarily through fights, you can unlock new buffs and upgrades on an incredibly fluid and customizable skill tree. You can unlock one new node per level, and when you've unlocked enough new nodes, you can add a grid to your skill tree, which basically gives you more options and new nodes for the future. So your skill tree starts out pretty small, but as you level up, it gets bigger and bigger and allows you to get more powerful upgrades. There is a huge diversity in what upgrades the nodes can give you. Some nodes are incredibly simple, 
like giving you increased stat points to one of those three main stats or letting you remove a card from your deck. Others are more complicated. Some let you select traits that correspond to each stat for your character. For example, there are strength traits that increase your melee damage or give your character additional health. And there are also nodes that give you two ways to upgrade your cards. You can rank cards up, which give your cards a straight stat or number increase, and you can master cards. And that allows you to choose between one of two modifiers for each card. For example, one modifier might give raw damage for a card, and the other modifier might increase the status effect or condition effect on that card instead. As you add more grids to your skill tree, you'll be able to unlock more powerful nodes, which might give you access to more AP each turn, or allow you to select more powerful, higher tier traits. Additionally, each time you add a new grid to your skill tree, you can choose one of three decks or play styles for each character. When you unlock the corresponding card nodes for this grid, you can choose cards of that style. For example, for the Ranger Hero, one deck gives you straight damage, arrow attack cards. The second deck allows you to lay traps and push and pull enemies into them. And the third final deck allows you to summon allied turrets to help you on your fights. These nodes are one of two main ways that you add cards to your deck. Choosing a certain deck or play style for each grid allows you to customize what kinds of cards you have in your deck and in return allows you to customize the playstyle for each character on your team. Altogether, I quite like the skill tree system. It's very customizable and allows for very specific fine tuning of your characters and their builds. There's also a fun puzzle-like quality to it when you choose which grids to add to your skill tree in what order you want to unlock nodes in order to reach certain nodes, certain powerful traits, things like that. But it can also be overwhelming at times because there are so many systems involved, including ones that I haven't even talked about, like respect points or synergy cards. In general, each of the 10 characters in this game best utilizes one or two of the stats, but almost every character has cards for each of the three stats. So you could theoretically run a dexterities build for almost every character. Focusing on one stat for each character lets you to focus your deck on those cards and make them incredibly powerful. It also allows you to fully utilize the higher level traits that require a certain number of stat points in order to unlock them. And as a quick aside, I think Gorgian Quest does a pretty good job of hitting the main character or hero archetypes that you'd want to play as. You have a rogue archetype, a ranger, various spell crafters, things like that. And I was pleasantly surprised with the mix of very simple characters that are really easy to learn with characters that have incredibly high skill ceilings like the bard character. It was always fun to create a team of three heroes and plan out their synergies. In addition to the extensive skill tree, each character also has a lot of gear slots for you to equip various items, like weapons, armor, and trinkets, as well as slots for consumables you can use in fights. If you've played Trials of Fire, this gear system functions very similarly. The gear comes in four main varieties of increasing power. At the basic level, gear provides mostly stat buffs to your character. These can be simple or general stat increases, like increasing your character's strength or initiative. Or they can be more niche or conditional effects, like increasing the power of very specific status effects. In addition to these built-in buffs, gear also have sockets on them, which allow you to slot in runes and give you even more stat increases. Because gear can give you buffs each of the three main stats, strength, dexterity, and intelligence, it's important to have one of your characters on your team that can utilize each of those three stats. Otherwise, you have a lot of wasted gear. Outside of those more direct buffs, gear can also interact with your deck in two different ways. First, some gear adds new cards to your deck. These can be standard cards you have in your deck already, or they can be new, incredibly powerful cards in the case of legendary gear. For the gear that has cards attached, you can use the sockets on that gear to modify those cards and make them more powerful. It's also incredibly easy to modify that gear in order to make that card not be added to your deck. So if you really don't like that card, but you want the gear, it's very easy to do that. And I think that's really great for build crafting. In addition to gear that has those built in cards, some gear also lets you add cards from your regular deck onto them. And this allows you to modify those cards with runes, giving them more buffs or effects, just making them more powerful. As you can see, like the skill tree, this gear system has a lot of mechanics that are involved including many that I don't want to dive into because I've already talked about too many. There are rune levels, you can reroll sockets. There's just a lot of things going on. The complexity of this gear system gives it so much customization potential 
And you can really craft your characters in very specific ways to fit certain build or play style, really whatever you're looking for. This can be incredibly fun to do. And as I mentioned earlier, you really don't have to engage with all these systems in order to have fun and be successful. The biggest flaw with the skill tree in gear system is, as I've said, there's just so much going on. You have to learn so many different systems. And importantly, you have to weed through all of them to find out which ones are actually important. And it's very easy to miss incredibly powerful mechanics. There were a lot of systems that I didn't know existed until 15 hours in, like being able to add regular cards from your deck onto your gear. Even now, I'm sure there's some system that's important or powerful or fun to play around with that I just don't know exist because there's just so much to search through. So I think Gordian Quest would benefit from removing some of the game systems because it feels a little bloated. At the same time, though, I think it's hard to point to any specific system or aspect of the equipment or skill tree and say that that particular element is bad or unnecessary. That's because a lot of these small systems on their own are just fine. And generally, they give you a lot of flexibility and customization. It just feels like collectively, when you add it all together, it's a bit too much. And it feels like small mechanics were added here and there, but nothing was ever removed and there was no streamlining of the game. So now let's talk about the first of two main game modes, which is a campaign game mode that takes about 10 to 15 hours. You can play the campaign at several different difficulty levels, as well as a couple of different game modes, which are basically how much progress you save after dying. Some of these game modes make you lose progress and have to somewhat restart, but the real roguelike game mode comes later on, and I'll talk about that in a bit. The campaign is split up into four acts, each of which have their own location, bosses, and overarching narrative. I think the story in the campaign is very okay, is fine. I always read the dialogue because I had a passing interest in the world, but I was never super eager to learn more about it, and the story was just not the highlight for me. Each act has a separate home base or town with merchants, the ability to heal, change which heroes are on your team, things like that. They'll have a main quest line and a couple optional quests you can do with their own bosses and you'll adventure out from your town and navigate an overworld of nodes that are connected via outline paths. Navigating these nodes costs supply as well. These are incredibly cheap and easy to come by, but there is some basic resource management there that you have to look out for. The act of exploration out of the home base and navigating this map of connected nodes reminded me some of Darkest Dungeon, but I wouldn't say it's a super close comparison. Nodes can be straightforward enemy fights with that gameplay that I talked about earlier, or they can be a couple other things. There are exploration nodes, which are a very simple mini game where you try to avoid enemies to reach randomized piles of stuff that can give you items or various buffs. There are also text events, which might be simple text options where you choose a desired outcome, or they can be stat rolls where your odds of success are determined by your character stats. These obviously feel directly inspired by tabletop and D&D type games with a virtual dice roll deciding your fate and outcome. There are also a couple less common node types like shrines that give buffs and debuffs to random fights on the map and there are rest stops which let you heal and get supplies. I found these non-combat encounters to be fine at first but after a while I realized I don't really need to engage with these events. They give you some loot but you get plenty of other items throughout the campaign. And they also quickly became pretty repetitive because of their simplicity. Because of that, I started just skipping them and streamlining toward the bosses. This didn't really hurt me at all, and the overworld in general has a lot of optional events and encounters that you can just skip. I played the campaign on one of the harder difficulties, but I didn't have that much of a challenge getting through most of the content. Act 1 is incredibly easy, and while it does pick up as the game goes on, I only had a couple team deaths throughout my 15 hour campaign. The forgiving nature of the campaign and the ability to skip unwanted events make the campaign game mode more approachable to new or more casual players. And I think at least starting out with the campaign mode can be a great way to learn the mechanics of the game. You can get a feel for the deck building and the skill trees. And one of the things I liked about the campaign was the ability to build craft over a long period of time and slowly work towards a build. At the same time, because of how easy the campaign was, you really don't have to engage with most of the game systems. I think that's one of the main reasons that I avoided system overload in this game, because I basically just ignored most of the game systems when I first started playing. For example, I didn't experiment with adding runes to equipment until over halfway through the campaign, and that's one of the main ways to modify gear. I just didn't do it, 
and it didn't really matter. One nice thing about the campaign mode is that even the heroes you aren't actively using will still level up, although albeit more slowly than your three main heroes. This makes it easier to try out different teams of heroes if you want to, because they're all at the appropriate level. But honestly, I mostly just stuck to those three heroes they started out with, because I found it a hassle to constantly move gear between characters, and using a new character also meant leveling up their skill tree, which was a bit of a hassle and just felt a little tedious. Now let's talk about the roguelike game mode, which as a roguelite fan, that was the main reason that I wanted to play Gordian Quest in the first place. This game mode uses a simple branching Slay the Spire like overworld that you can navigate, and it uses similar nodes to those you find in the campaign. But there are a couple adjusted to better fit that roguelite structure like merchant nodes. Certain paths will sometimes have random benefits or drawbacks to following them, like getting increased gold if you go a certain way. And I like that small addition that just spiced up the overworld a little bit. Your goal is to clear five different areas that have their own bosses. And if you do that, you win a run. But there is also an alternative infinite rogue light mode as well, which doesn't have a defined ending in the same way. One of the first things I noticed about the rogue light mode is that it's a lot harder than the campaign mode, even at lower difficulties. Even after beating the campaign on one of the harder difficulties, I wiped on my first boss on normal mode during my first try of the rogue light mode. This was kind of a shock to me when it happened, and I quickly learned that if you want to succeed in the rogue light mode, you actually have to engage with more of the game systems. Namely, you have to be more deliberate about team composition and utilizing gear and runes. In the rogue light mode at the start, you select your team of three heroes, and each hero also has an option of four different starting decks. I found it incredibly important to get a good balance of stat types, namely a hero that can use each of the three stats well. It was also important to me to have a hero that could tank up a lot of damage. As an aside here, I wish it was easier to have tank builds for characters, but a lot of cards you have the option to add to your deck later on are offensive in nature, even for characters that feel like they should have a tank option. After each encounter, I would also look at gear and runes for each of my characters, and I actually used a lot of consumables in the rogue light mode, despite having neglected them in the campaign mode. I actually quite liked being forced to actually use more of the game systems, because it allowed me to see some cool new interactions, like when I learned you can add runes to normal cards in your deck by using certain types of gear. Also, you have to pay a lot closer attention to what actions enemies and bosses are doing, because it's a lot higher stakes. So maybe you really appreciate the tactical and positioning elements in the game a lot more. For example, being able to avoid attacks by moving around or making sure attacks and debuffs hit that one character that has a lot of block stacks already are all very important things to learn. There are also very few opportunities for each character to be revived in the roguelite mode. So if you lose even one of your characters at any point in your run, it feels really bad. The main source of character revives in the game is by clearing the final boss of each area. So if you lose a character during the final boss fight itself, it's a lot less painful. But if you lose a character at any other point, it feels like your run is basically over, even if you haven't technically lost yet. I think the main thing that I really liked about the rogue light mode versus the campaign mode is you get a much better chance to build craft because you level up so much faster. Because of that, you can do deep dives into each skill tree organically. You can get a feel for the many different characters and their different play styles. That being said, Gordian Quest is still significantly slower and longer than other roguelites out there. I think my first successful run in this game took me over three hours, so it's just a lot more of a time commitment. You can save your runs throughout though, so you don't have to complete it all in one sitting. Along with those longer games, the build crafting just ramps up slower. In games like Slay the Spire or Monster Train, you really get into the meat of your build, get those fun synergies a lot faster. Also, while I think Guardian Quest has some great variety, a lot of that variety is self-driven. What I mean by that is, the characters you choose for your team, along with their starter decks and skill tree choices, determines a lot of your run-to-run -run variety. But you can make the same, or at least very similar choices, run-to-run. -run. Of course, there's a lot of variety in what gear you find, you can't always add the same cards to your deck, but even with that, the bulk of the variety in this game comes from you choosing your starting team and you planning what loadout you want for them. This felt fine for me when I played through it, but I think that front loading of the run from variety is going to limit my total playtime with this game. This is already quite a long video, but I have a couple stray thoughts before I wrap up. 
as a whole, I like the roguelike game mode more than the campaign mode, which is maybe not surprising to hear from a roguelite focused channel. But I think the roguelite mode is better because it forced me to more deeply engage with the build crafting and with the tactical and positioning elements of the game. I also found it easier to explore the different heroes and the different builds they have in this game mode. As I said before, I would probably still recommend starting with the campaign to get a feel for that basic gameplay. If you then want to keep going, I would probably finish the campaign first because the rogue light mode will spoil all the campaign bosses. Otherwise, I think you can just play the rogue light mode and still have a great time with it. Additionally, once you beat the campaign, there is another alternative rogue light mode in some missions you can do with your heroes from the campaign. This alternative rogue light mode is super noob friendly since you go back to town after each boss and losing doesn't have the same stakes. For me personally, this was just a more boring version of the actual roguelike game mode, so I didn't really play it that much. I should also say here, there is a third PvP game mode. It's direct PvP only, so you have to know somebody to play against them, and there's no online matchmaking. I never played it, so I have no opinion on it. Also, I did have a couple game crashes when I played the game. It mostly came when I was loading up fights, and the game would crash then. Gordian Quest constantly saves your progress, even in the roguelite mode, so these crashes never made me lose progress, but they were obviously still annoying. I was playing a press version of the game, so maybe that bug and instability has been patched in the normal version. The final thing I want to mention here before finishing up is the renown system. While everything else, like leveling up and gearing your characters, is game mode specific, you do collect one currency that spans all game modes, and that's called renown. You can collect Renown by just playing the game and winning fights. You primarily use this currency to buy artifacts and additional artifact slots. These artifacts or buffs or modifiers for your runs, and a lot of them are character or hero specific. For example, there's one artifact that gives plus one to all three of the main stats to the rogue hero. As a whole, this Renown system functions as a form of cross-run vertical progression. For the most part, these artifacts have a small to moderate sized impact on the game. You can unlock up to six artifact slots, and the collective impact of six artifacts or relics is actually important. The way you unlock new artifacts is basically paying Renown to gamble for your new relic. There are 65 relics in total, so it takes a while to actually get them all. Additionally, you can also upgrade each relic so that it has an additional buff of some kind. This upgrading process also costs Renown, but you don't need to upgrade every single relic. I think this relic system is mostly fine. It's a simple form of cross-run progression with important buffs that aren't game-breaking. However, there are a couple points where you can exchange Renown for an item or a buff in the rogue light mode, or alternatively, you might be forced to choose between getting a within-run buff or getting more Renown currency. I always hate trade-offs like that, where the game makes you choose between a long-run progression and within-run success. So I do wish that aspect of the renowned currency didn't exist. But at the same time, it just wasn't that big of a deal. So what's my verdict on Guardian Quest? Overall, I like the core gameplay. I like the mix of deck building, RPG elements, and tactical and positioning elements. I do think it's still first and foremost a deck builder with other elements added onto that. In my opinion, the game shines better in the rogue light mode than the campaign mode but the core gameplay is very similar in both. That being said, this game has too many different systems and mechanics. It would be incredibly easy to get overwhelmed with all these systems, and there are a couple very important mechanics that I completely missed, because there were so many less important mechanics that I had to sift through. I think this game could have been improved if they removed some of those excess systems and made the game feel less bloated at times. Outside of that, Gordian Quest just has a lot slower pacing than other card game roguelites which I guess is a pro or a con, depending on your opinion. But at the end of the day, I would recommend Guardian Quest for those looking for a different type of deck builder roguelite. And I think it's worth buying, even if you only want to play that roguelite mode. Huge shout out and thank you to all of our channel members for helping support the channel. Please like this video to help me out in the algorithm, and thanks for watching.